My name is Pai Duyen and I'm the Director of Education here at the Women's Historical Society. And I must say you all made me feel very welcome because somebody asked me if I was Erwin Miller's son. <laughs> somebody came up and said, are you Erwin Miller's son? And I said, no, but thank you. I think that's a compliment. Uh, I know that a lot of you are new to the Women's Historical Society, so Ava told me to tell you about our campus. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty big campus. It basically consists of four buildings. We have the historic Bush Holly House. Uh, we also have the, the gallery where we'll be uh, mounting an exhibition on the Civil War very soon. It opens actually on April 6th. We also have our archives, which are right across from this, uh, from this building. And we have this building, which is the Vanderbilt Education Center, where we provide lectures and give tours to children. And we have a beautiful studio in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, so just a little history as to this collaboration. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but uh, Greenwich, uh, the Greenwich Library is doing a program called Greenwich Reads Together. And we thought uh, for this program, that it would be really great to do a collaboration with, with you guys with the Jewish Historical Society of Lower Fairfield County. Uh, so we contacted Ava Weller, and we uh, decided to uh, bring the exhibition here to the barn, as well as working on this lecture that Erwin Miller will be giving today. And I also just wanted to point out that uh, next week, uh, here again in the exact same place at the exact same time, uh, uh, we'll be doing, and uh, I'll, be, I'll be reading this from uh, Eva gave me, uh, next week's program in collaboration with JHS will be held on April 3rd in conjunction with Greenwich Weeks Together, featuring the book Thief, a fictional story of Holocaust survival. survival. We will feature a panel discussion by Holocaust survivors from Greenwich who were hidden children the panel will be led by Agnes Verte of West End, also a survivor and president of the Holocaust Child Survivors of Connecticut. So with that, and again, that will be next week, right here in the bar also. Uh, so without further, I also recommend we have these flyers, which were produced by the Greenwich Library, that, that pretty much list all the programs that we're doing for Greenwich Weeks together, and I highly recommend you take one on your way out. And without further ado, I will introduce Ava Weller, I'm sure you all know. It's your president, so. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see you all. I know that there are some new faces, so um, I, if I can ask how many people are members of the Jewish Historical Society? Okay, and how many are members of the Greenwich Historical Society? Wonderful. A great, a great collaboration in all ways. Um, I, I wanted to thank Jaime and uh, Deborah for um, a very warm welcome and for housing the JHS uh, traveling exhibit this month and inviting our uh, founder and historian, Erwin Miller, to present on a slice of American Jewish life. It's really been a pleasure working with Deborah Mackey and Jaime. Um, and I hope that we will be able to work together again in the future to bring community more excellent programs. Uh, for those of you who don't know about the Jewish Historical Society of Lower Fairfield County, uh, we hold stimulating monthly programs on many aspects of Jewish culture, and they're all free and open to the public and they're held monthly. Uh, the JHS Library is located at the Stanford JCC and holds an, ex an extensive Holocaust collection of a wide range of books on Jewish subjects for all ages. The library also holds monthly book talks, with the next one on April 27th, and I believe we have some handouts that you can get more detailed information. Uh, you may not know that the uh, JHS also has the Jewish Archives, and it's located at 990 Hope Street in Stanford, behind the State Cinema, and we're most happy to welcome people when we have a tour of, of the archives. We have an ongoing oral history project, and several years ago, the Oral Historical Society joined our group, and we now have a separate room in our archives for um, uh, the New York Historical Society's um, archives. So if you'd like more information about upcoming programs, um, please look for our handouts, which, which I just would like to mention to Gail Trow, our guest president, uh, or any of our board members. I don't have mine on, but others, if you have any questions about how to join or more information. Miller, who's the 
our historian and very knowledgeable about um, many aspects of, of, of American Jewish history. Erwin is a teacher, lecturer, and a guide for trips of historical interest covering Fairfield and Westchester counties, as well as the Lower East Side. He contributed, um, through his research, the article on the history of Stanford's Jewish community to the latest edition of the Encyclopedia of Judaica in 2008. He has taught adult education courses on the history of American Jewry in Stanford and Greenwich, and co-worked with the Jewish communities in Greater Stanford. So with that, I'd like to welcome Erwin Bakuta, and I hope you enjoy. Good afternoon. Before I begin, uh, our archives are open by appointment, uh, and uh, we welcome you uh, to uh, see the facilities that we have and the material that's there. It's a, just a, an ocean of information concerning uh, the Jews of Fairfield County. We are the only we are the only Jewish archives in all of Fairfield County, uh, which means that uh, uh, what what uh, information we have since the earliest days of Jewish settlement here is in our society based on the research we and others have done up to the present day. Uh, I might add that pick up any uh, Jewish encyclopedia and any mention of any Jewish settlers in Greenwich or Stanford uh, before 1880 is a myth, almost myth. Uh, my research of early Jews in Connecticut coastal towns in the town of Derby, England, during the period of 1718 through 1732, shows a distinct pattern of Jewish settlement. When looking at a map of coastline uh, Connecticut, uh, it's uh, there's at least I found I found that there, there's at least one Jewish merchant in Stanford, Norwalk, Fairfield, Stratford, and Upriver in Derby. It is even possible that Moses Levy, a prominent New York merchant and ship owner, had settled briefly in Stanford, as evidenced by a copy of a uh, document that I found in a ledger many years ago in the Ferguson Library by accident. Uh, I, I began to realize that both Greenwich and Stanford, located on the Post Road, had to have had some early Jewish settlement at one time or another. And if you look at the Jewish encyclopedias, you see your settlers came in 1860 or uh, 1880 or thereabouts, but nothing about any earlier people. And so uh, in my research, uh, some of it came by accident, just sleuthing. I walked into the Ferguson Library on Saturday morning, and I came across a ledger on the reference shelf. And I opened it up, and I see names in there. Uh, these were copies of uh, people that had purchased property in the Stanford in the early days, and I said, well, I'll look for a Jewish name. What else do I have to go on? So I looked and I figured, well, I'll pick out the name of Levy. And uh, I look and then somebody had written this all in longhand. It wasn't very old. And I find Moses Levy purchased property in 1698 in Stanford. And uh, perhaps I can read, read it from you. I'll read this. Uh, uh, what I found, it was in Book B, page 157, and it was June 23rd, 1698, <clears throat> as follows. These presents witnesseth this 23rd day of June, 1698, and of course this is whatever I say that, it's written as YT, as the language of the uh, dialect at that time, that I, Mary Turney, do acknowledge that I have received of my husband Joseph Turney, the money that I desired my said husband to go and receive of Moses Levy that I owe, which was due to me, for Dinah, my Negro, which I sold to the said Moses Levy, and I had the said money to dispose of as I seek cause as witness of my hand. And uh, then it's signed by Mary Turner. Now, and some witnesses here. Now, uh, this wasn't recorded until May 31st, 1716, and I've been unable to find, well, find just why it took so long for it to be recorded. Uh, my theory is, and it's only a theory, that in 1716, by that time, Moses Levy had become a very prominent shipowner and merchant in New York. Uh, and the Jewish 
the Jews at that time didn't have any specific neighborhood. Uh, they lived in the areas where uh, many of the prosperous merchants, sh other ship owners lived. And so uh, uh, Mo Moses, uh, Moses Levy, by that time, was, pr was uh, uh, prosperous enough to purchase half of Mercy Island in Rye, New York. And so, uh, uh, for some reason or other, I am surmising only that because of the purchase of the half of Mercy Island, uh, that possibly that had something to do with him taking that, all that time to have this document recorded from 1698. So that was my first uh, inkling that there was a Jewish presence much earlier than 1860 or whatever, 1859 in Stanford. And so I'll, I'll go next to uh, Greenwich. Um, Greenwich, I really had nothing to go on, uh, except uh, I, I, don't, I don't recall exactly where I got the first tip from, but I recall going into the Greenwich Library and picking up, looking up the history of all of Greenwich. And I see a number of, I, looked, I figured I would take a, a chance and look at some names that might be Jewish and might have been known to me by that time. And so I picked out one here. I see several members of the Hayes family. Uh, the Hayes I knew of from early settlers in Bedford Village. And uh, I saw there, there was an Abraham Hayes uh, on December 11th, 1728. He bought land in Gershom Lockwood. Well, it turns out that with the help, of course, of Malcolm Stern's Americans of Jewish descent, uh, I find out that Abraham uh, had several brothers and sisters and who uh, had settled nearby in Rye, New York, uh, by 1721. And so here, in the, in the historic of the town of Greenwich, which I found in the Greenwich Library, it says Abraham Hayes purchased that land of Gershom Lockwood. And then we talk about two other brothers here, who tie in with the Bush uh, Holly House here, with the Bush property. Uh, David Hayes, who on June 26, 1735, bought land, uh, and it has here, this is David Hayes, he bought land from his brother Jacob Hayes. And then Jacob sold it back to David, and so forth and so on. But the reason I'm bringing that out is because uh, uh, the, uh, the Hayes family was very active in this area. In fact, one of the one of the other brothers, Jacob Hayes, was, um, was, was in business with a, with a prominent merchant in New York, Tyus Beekman, and they were mining for ore on Hard Pen Ridge, but I don't know where that is somewhere in this area. Um, I might add also that um, you might want to take a look. This is Moses Levy when he was very prosperous. By the time I mentioned, by the time of 1716, and uh, this is his second wife, uh, Grace Mears. Uh, she may have lived for a short time in the Bush Holly House because her husband uh, was David Hayes, and he bought uh, the Bush Holly House here uh, from his brother Jacob when they were buying and selling each other for a year or two. Uh, she, she, uh, they may have lived here before they moved to uh, New Jersey, so I might just like might want to take a look at this a little bit later. Now, the uh, I, I, I have been searching for other um, clues as to early Jewish settlement in Greenwich, and uh, some years ago I wrote a letter to Greenwich Times because I, I was frustrated; I couldn't find anything else. And I said I was looking for uh, uh, descendants of early families here. And I just mentioned a few names. And I got a, a note from uh, a member of the Colgro family. And, and, they, and this, uh, this, this lady said to me, uh, she wrote, uh, she would like to know why I wanted this information. And I told her. And she said, well, she uh, gave me some information. And she said that her sister-in-law had done the genealogy of the, of the early family, and that she was a descendant of uh, Esther Hayes. And I later found out in tracing that Esther was the daughter of Abraham Hayes. And as, we've, as we will notice in, in researching this, most of the early Jewish settlers, practically all of them, married Christians. 
So their descendants uh, were all Christian. This happened here in Greenwich. Uh, it did not happen in Stanford because uh, Jacob Hart, uh, an early, one of the early Jewish settlers at Stanford, who came there about 1725, uh, uh, married uh, a member of the, um, I think it was the Levy family also, uh, and brought her here from New York. But in Norwalk, Ralph Isaacs uh, married a Christian. And um, I might mention, I recorded years ago being here in the Bush, in the uh, Bush Holly House, in the entry hall. I don't know if it's still there. There's a picture of Sarah Isaacs. Now, she's not to be confused with David, with uh, David Bush's first wife. Um, David Bush's first wife was Sarah Isaacs. Not to be confused with Sarah Scudder Isaacs, whose painting is in the entry hall there. Sarah Isaacs was a daughter of an early Jewish settler in Norwalk, Ralph Isaacs. And, uh, well, I'm taking, maybe a little bit far afield, but I'll try and stay with me if you can. And I welcome questions. I welcome, please, please do. Uh, so Sarah Isaacs was the daughter of the of Jewish poet Ralph Isaacs who had worked for another Jewish merchant in Fairfield in those early days, Andrus Truby, uh, alias Amschel Troy, from Lithuania. And uh, Amschel, of course, had, by way of, of uh, probably Holland or England, uh, went to, uh, eventually ended up in Boston, was in partnership with a fellow named Solomons, they were merchants, and decided for whatever reason to go to settle in Fairfield uh, sometime about 1712, I believe, 1714. And eventually, Ralph Isaacs uh, went to clerk for him. And in a few years, by 1724, 25, Ralph moved south to uh, Norwalk. Uh, before he did, he married a Christian woman named Mary Rumsey. And they settled in Norwalk. He became a very prominent citizen, arranged for the land purchase for St. Paul's on the Green Church, which has the burying ground. And in that burying ground, if you, still, you can still see it. Uh, is the gravestone of Ralph Isaacs. Now, uh, I'm not, uh, I only have one supposition. Uh, Ralph's wife died, uh, Mary Rumsey Isaacs, in 1761. Um, she's buried up in what is now the entry to the door of the church. And as are two of his children, uh, in fact, one of them, Benjamin Isaacs, was the first husband of Sarah Isaacs, who ties him with this house, but in any event. Uh, so that, um, uh, so, so that, so that Ra Ra Ralph Isaacs is, is buried down, not next to them, but he's buried down in the gully. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm told that's not, that's not the necessary, necessarily the reason but it's just a supposition that I have, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, I'll show you, I think I have a slide here of uh, Ralph Isaac's uh, tombstone, which I took some years ago. In any event, uh, Ralph's daughter married, um, uh, let me see if I get this right now, Ra 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 Ralph, Ralph's, oh, Ra Ralph's, son's ben Ralph's, son, Ralph's son Benjamin uh, married, Sarah Isaacs, who was the first Sarah Isaacs connected with the Bush Holly house here. Uh, she died uh, about 1775, and he marries uh, a woman named Sarah Scudder Isaacs. And uh, she is the one whose picture, whose portrait hangs here in the hall. Uh, she was Christian, she was not uh, Jewish at all. No, no, no connection. Uh, so that, um, All right, I think it's time that perhaps we show up some slides and try to illustrate what I'm speaking about. Thanks. It's not that. Now, some of the documents I, I placed on slides many years ago, uh, I got rid of them. I'll have to explain what I'm speaking about. Uh, this is Moses Levy, and he was already a very prosperous New York merchant. 
Uh, he died in 1728, so this is, this is probably done by the artist, the artist Viking, about 1725. And uh, you'll notice the ship in the background is painting and denoting his, uh, his business. And so uh, <coughs> he was also the grandfather of the first Jewish children born in Stanford in 1747 through 1753. And uh, next. Uh, now th this letter is dated Stanford, uh, February uh, 1721. And it's the letter, uh, it's a Dunning letter. It, it re it's a reply to a Dunning letter. It's the, uh, it's the letter of, uh, of uh, Simpson, Mr. Simpson, to, uh, uh, to, to, to a, apparently he owes money uh, to a Mr. Sturge, and Sturge is dunning him uh, for, the, for the goods that he has. And he says the crops are bad and, and uh, things are not going very close to pay him. And eventually, but this is shows you the early Jewish presence as a early merchant in Stanford. Now, um, within a few years, um, he was gone and he left and eventually ended up in Rhode Island and uh, joined the Congregational Church there, uh, Simpson. But, uh, most trace. But this is a, an example of an early, early presence in Stanford. That's why I'm using this. Next, please. Now, here we have uh, the, uh, the letter, and uh, I'll just read better. Uh, Mr. Simpson, I received by Mr. Sturridge yours, and I'm so um, surprised uh, to hear that you are uh, angry with me and so forth. And it goes on about this. Uh, things are bad, and this pretty much tells you. Uh, next, please. Uh, this is another letter. Uh, this one, oh, this one is uh, uh, he's, uh, it's written, it's written to a uh, signed by Nehemiah Marks. It's also a letter. Of, it gives you an example of the presence that the Jews had in the early church. Next, please. Erwin, yes. do you want to take the microphone so we can hear you better? Oh, yes. Yes, the microphone is moved also. Uh, this, is, this is a letter written by Nehemiah Marks. And uh, the Marks family is another example, a very successful Um, Nehemiah Marx is another example of, uh, of a Jewish presence who also comes, set, settles in the valley in Derby, uh, all about uh, uh, in the early 18th century, and uh, marries, and marries a Christian, Christian woman raises his children as, as Christians, and uh, the Marx name became very prominent in Connecticut, and is still found here in this state. As a matter of fact, I recall uh, the Judge Shapiro of the Derby many years ago telling me that uh, he had met an uh, Episcopal bishop in Connecticut named Marx, and the bishop said he was very proud of his Jewish ancestor. But uh, there were two Nehemiah Marx. One Nehemiah Marx remained and became very prosperous in Derby. Uh, and one of his uh, sons, one of his sons settled in Stanford about 1770 and eventually was a loyalist and eventually during the revolution uh, fled up towards Maine. Uh, but uh, these are examples of Jewish merchants and, and, and making their way and didn't always pan out, but uh, uh, they, were, they, were, they, they were a presence then. Next, please. Now, here we have a scene in Stanford at the Main Street Bridge. Um, now, I mentioned Jacob, uh, Jacob Hart previously. Uh, his house is the one on the right, that gamble dwelling, and there's a mill next to it. Now, I don't think he owned the mill at that point, 
Although by 1738, I found that he was the fifth highest taxpayer in Stanford. Um, apparently, uh, he was a professing Jew. He couldn't he couldn't be serve on a grand jury, and he couldn't vote. But he was he had apparently had a very uh, successful um, career in Stanford. Uh, remained there for uh, more than 35 years. Uh, to my knowledge, he did. He was not married until about 1746, uh, when he marries uh, uh, one of the uh, one young Jewish woman from uh, New York. Brings her here. Uh, they had three children, and remained here until uh, 1763, when the Turo Synagogue was uh, dedicated in Newport, Rhode Island, and Jacob Hart had three brothers living there at that time. So he. Uh, he finally left Stanford with his family, and they moved to Newport. And as later on, of course, as a uh, loyalist family, uh, they, they fled. They were supposed to live, move to Nova Scotia, but they ended up in New York and eventually back to London. But uh, what, I'm, what I'm pointing out here is that apparently Jacob Hart never really seemed to have had a problem uh, with being Jewish in that area at that time. Uh, by in 17 by 1737 he was he had leased a few mills in Darien uh, down near Rings at Rings and Lumber somewhere in that area and uh, he also had bought a home by 1761 although I don't know if he ever lived there on the post road I saw a real estate transaction from that time so that uh, apparently uh, the the restrictions if any were were few except for the voting and serving on the jury and so forth. So he was very satisfied, apparently, with his, uh, his living in the Stanford at that time. Next, please. And here we have the mill I'm speaking of, um, at, the, uh, at the Mill River in Stanford. Next, please. And here we have Moses Lady, uh, who we saw before. Uh, he had a very successful career. He was a, uh, what's unusual about the, uh, the synagogue in New York, uh, it was the first time that a synagogue using the Sephardic ritual, uh, and where the members were not equally divided at that time, uh, had a uh, uh, had a president, a, a partner of the congregation, who was uh, of Ashkenazic background. These, the Sephardic Jews, they were very, I found the presence of Connecticut of Sephardic Jews was very small, extremely small. All these early Jews that I've, I've shown you are all of Ashkenazic background, all of them, including most of of course. He was the president of the congregation uh, in the 1720s, his brother Samuel Levy before him, and the inscriptions on his gravestone, the old bower in the old Chatham Square burying ground near Chinatown in New York, says on there that he was the Parnas of the congregation. Uh, next place. And this is Grace Mears, who was uh, who was the who was the uh, second wife of, uh, of David Hayes. Now uh, she was uh, she was the first wife of. Uh, second wife of Moses Levy, who we've just shown you. But uh, Grace Spears I've shown here because, as I mentioned previously, she may have lived for a short time, maybe, perhaps maybe a year or so, uh, here at the Bush, at the Bush Homestead. And uh, later on, they moved to New Jersey. Uh, next, please. Uh, now, this is uh, uh, the uh, mother of, uh, of the gentleman who was called the Patriot Rabbi of the American Revolution, Gershon Mendesatius. And uh, the connection with Connecticut is, is that uh, uh, when, the, when the revolution uh, broke out, uh, her son, Gershon Mendesatius, and his wife uh, left New York with one of the tourists from the synagogue and were fleeing up to Stratford, Connecticut here, but they were to meet other relatives from Newport <clears throat> and uh, live out the war there. And he remained in Stratford with the group until 1779 uh, when he was called to minister to the congregation of Philadelphia, Israel. So um, 
Uh, but she she was a, one of the children, one of the numerous children of Moses Lee, that merchant. She is one of them. By the way, I'm, I might add that um, when, um, when when Hazan Satius was uh, fleeing on his way up to Stratford, leaving New York, uh, he came by this route here on the post road, and then of course they took the river road along the Mianus River there and up what is now Palmer's Hill Road, and there's still there's still a, a, a you can still see the uh, an old uh, marker mile marker. It says 22 miles, I think, to Fairfield. Holmes Hill, which is a replica, really, the original song. In any event, um, so that we can envision the, the, the route they took in those days, which is a very uh, arduous one. Next, please. And then here's the Hazan in his early days, Gershon Mendy Satius. Uh, it's identified as him, although it looks nothing like his later portraits. Absolutely nothing that I, at least that's my view. Uh, but uh, he was the first American-born, what they call minister, because he wasn't an, an ordained rabbi. He didn't have a seminary. He was, uh, so uh, uh, he was called the Reverend. Now, he's also noted for preaching the first Thanksgiving Day sermon pre uh, preached by any clergyman of any faith in the city of New York, according to George Washington's proclamation in 1789. So he has that distinction. But he, he, really, he really was a... Uh, uh, the answer to a, to a leader uh, in those days, he was American-born and, and uh, of course related to the uh, most of the members of the congregation at that time. Next, please. And uh, here we have a, a page that I made a copy of, Ye History of the Ye Town of Greenwich. And, uh, Uh, first on the list, I'll point out third main man is Jacob Hart. He was a Stanford a Jewish uh, businessman, uh, merchant, uh, and it says there, uh, June 11, 1746, gold man of Jeremiah Schofield here in Greenwich at that time. Now, uh, uh, there was something else I wanted to point out, but it slips my mind at the moment about. Uh, Jacob, uh, Jacob Hart. Uh, next you have Samuel Hart, but I don't know whether, he did have a brother named Samuel, but I don't know whether that, that's the same, one of the same. Next uh, we come down to, uh, down here, Abraham Hayes, the several of the 1728 ball man of Gershom Lockwood. And I believe that Gershom Lockwood, I read somewhere, was his, later became his father-in-law, and, uh, but I'm not sure of that. And, uh, but Abraham Hayes uh, owned land all around this area here, where this Bush Holly House is all around this area. There's two, two, two of us with him. All right. Next, please. All right, this is a view of the harbor, and this is, this is the... Uh, the area where uh, uh, Abraham Hayes, uh, like many others, I hoped at one time would develop into another Newport, Rhode Island seaport, which it never did. And so uh, uh, that's why I show this. But also because uh, uh, Hayes did own uh, quite a bit of land down in this area. And uh, of course the, uh, his brothers, uh, Jacob and David, uh, did occupy and own the, uh, the original Bush Holly House here uh, in, in 1730. Uh, actually, uh, Jacob Hayes bought the house, uh, uh, bought, bought the Bush House in 1735 and sold it in, uh, uh, bought it in 1734. And then sells it the following year uh, to his brother, uh, to his brother David Hayes, and then he buys her back the following year after David Hayes married Grace Spears, and uh, 
and finally, uh, uh, Jacob Hayes sells it the following year to uh, the, the DeMille brothers. Anthony DeMille was one of them, I, I recall. And, uh, and then the, the, the DeMille sold it um, to, uh, just, uh, to uh, David Bush. Justice Bush, sorry. Justice Bush. But in any event, that's the next, please. Uh, that's just the photo I took of the Bush Holly marker. Next, please. And a photo of the uh, Bush Holly House. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'm correct on this because uh, I, I theorize that possibly that wing on the left was the original house. And uh, when, when Justice, uh, uh, when David Bush expanded the house, go, this addition, I don't know. I'm not an authority on that one. Uh, next, please. And again, that's great because I think we can move on from there. Uh, okay, now this this is a, a record of a uh, of a Moab, uh, one who performed circumcisions, religious circumcisions, Jewish circumcisions. And so here we have one of uh, David, uh, Judah's son in Norwalk, a circumcision. His son is Michael Judah. And, uh, and then there's another one of Meyer Benjamin in the Yonkers, what is now called Yonkers, in those days. And, and the Moel kept this record book, which is now in the possession of the American Jewish Historical Society. Uh, Michael Judah, like, so, like I mentioned, like so many of the other early Jews, uh, had married a Christian but apparently had some circ circumcised and, and uh, he uh, hoped, I suppose, to uh, have his son raised in the Jewish faith, but that was not to be because the son, as an adult, joined the Congregational Church. And the Judas, even though the name sounds, of course, Jewish, are uh, all Christians uh, for, since that time. Uh, next, please. And uh, now here, maybe difficult to see. This, as you can see, is Ralph Isaac's stone in the cemetery at St. Paul's on the Green in Norwalk, and it gives you the date, it says 1763. Now I have been told by someone this is not actually his uh, stone, the stone, the tombstone was stolen many years ago, they don't know who took it of course, and uh, this, is a, this is what he called a footstone, uh, so that may just be something that was at the foot of the original. But it is a marker there, and of course it marks his resting place. So he was a prominent, a very prominent uh, Norwalk merchant, and uh, was, was, the, was the ancestor of so many prominent families, uh, like Ralph Isaac Inger, Ingersoll, uh, who was the, I think he was the founding editor or publisher of, of a newspaper called PM back about 1941 or whatever. Uh, and there were so many families in America that are descended from the Isaacs. Uh, next, please. And here's another example of the Marx family. This one's in uh, Huntington, Connecticut here. And uh, that's the, uh, the house that he built, Hezekiah. Uh, he was the son of the uh, Jewish Nehemiah Marx. And uh, it's now the Huntington Historic Society. But th this is all indicative of a Jewish presence throughout Connecticut in those days. Uh, but of course, those who stayed, um, I, in fact, I, I made a, uh, I don't know if I can locate that quickly here, but I made an interesting observation uh, of uh, many of those, those, of those early Jewish settlers who came, and uh, the chances of their remaining Jewish, if they remained, was, was practically nil. So uh, some of them may have, may have come and left, and those who stayed, uh, of course, uh, disappeared into the general population. May I ask to add yes. something to this, please? Sure. Uh, there were, uh, I had a history class of Judaism, and the early Jews that came to the United States were in the year 1400s. And in those days, they were not allowed to buy any properties or to go into any kind of businesses. They could have had no politics, no nothing. They were just able to breathe here, couldn't even start any businesses. Then they started to develop the West, and the Jews, many of the Jews, went out west 
there they were allowed to buy properties and start businesses. Well, not, well, not with any far field, but far field. But, but can, can I ask you a question? What was that year that you said, or the century that the, uh, you said that the Jews were not permitted to? No, they came in the, year, in the early 1400s. No, no, no. It's not, it's, we'll discuss this later. That's a little far field, please. All right, now let's move on. Next, please. Uh, that's just the at the Hezekiah Marks House in Huntington. Next, please. Uh, now, here's another example. This is Armstrong Troy's descent, one of his descendants. There were thousands of troopers now all over the United States who were not Jewish, of course. And uh, but this is this photo dates from it's from Bridgeport, uh, roughly about uh, probably about 1890 or whatever. Uh, but it gives you an example. The name is spelled T-R-U-B-Y, or with a double E like here. And uh, uh, he was another very interesting, successful uh, merchant. And if you'd like to, after my talk, um, I can show you copies of a petition signed by uh, Connecticut Jewish Merchants of Fairfield County, which they presented to the uh, colonial legislature at that time, protesting against extra levies and taxes and so forth. Uh, and he, he signs his name, Andrus Truby. He signs it in English, and then he signs it right below in Hebrew on his petition. The year is 1749, and there were two or three other Jewish merchants who signed that same petition. So they were, uh, um, uh, well, I can't recall the names right now, but uh, uh, there were at least three of, three of them on there uh, on that petition. Uh, so that's, uh, next please. And uh, in Fairfield here, well, we can't see it really. <clears throat> this, is a, this is a copy of a map, and it's a map showing where it says the Jews Cemetery uh, in, uh, in that area. It's uh, dated from about 1859, 59, I believe, 56. Uh, that, the, Jew, the, uh, the, one in Fair, the one in Fairfield, actually, it's on the Fairfield Bridgeport line on the uh, on the uh, King's Highway, and uh, for example, uh, Tobias Bernhard, a local resident called him Tobias Bernard, uh, is very. He was a member. There was there was no. He was he was uh, he was an assimilated uh, Jew. He, he didn't uh, when he first came here. Of course, there was no Jewish congregation in Stanford. Uh, there was none. No organized group until one began. In, it was July of 1889, uh, go to the Shalom, and that went out of existence. And so the one today dates from like 1904. But, um, but, but, get, but getting back to uh, uh, the Bernard family, when he came here, they were from, I believe, uh, Poland. Uh, they, um, uh, they, never, they became very assimilated, and they continued to belong to congregation of B'nai Israel, in Bridgeport, that was the closest. And so when Tobias Bern Bernhard, or Bernard, died in 1914, uh, he was buried in that cemetery up here in uh, Fairfield. Up here, that's the Congregation Cemetery up there. There's another Jewish, uh, Jewish cemetery in Fairfield, too. Yeah. Near Reed Street, somewhere near Reed Street. The Workman Circle. Yeah, there's a number of them. Yeah, later ones, of course. Yeah, yeah sure. So I don't know yeah. It's true. Yes, uh, next please. Uh, that, now this, as yes, you can see, I showed you an earlier uh, painting of, of Hazan Gershon Mendy Satius. And this one doesn't look anything like the one I showed before. Unless somebody sees what I don't see, I don't know. But anyway, uh, these are the, he's, he's wearing a typical Calvinist uh, clerical collar. And, uh, uh, no, the other one, was, they're not wearing wigs there, it's a different, you know, hair comb. But the, the other one was, apparently was purchased by an antique dealer, uh, another painting, uh, oh, possibly uh, 30, 30 year, 35 years ago or so. I can't recall his name. And he identified it, or I don't know who identified it for him, as that of Hazan Sations. But this we know has come down in the family as, as the best uh, uh, portrait that we have of what he actually uh, looked like. 
Well, actually, the, the city of New York, you know, I, was the, the area where the Jews lived was on uh, Stone Street, South William Street, near where Goldman Sachs uh, headquarters are now. Yeah. That was the Jewish area, Pearl Street, down near the Battery. And uh, they lived. They were they were living among the rest of the population. There was no such thing as a, as a Jewish uh, area at that time. It was a mix. And uh, so he he lived in that area down there. And uh, the synagogue was in South William Street. With, with eventually by 1790, it uh, consisted of about five buildings. Uh, but uh, anyway, let's move on. Next, please. Uh, and this is an example of the art of, uh, <clears throat> of Maya Myers, the silversmith. Uh, this is one example. Now, he took refuge here. Uh, he was here during at the outbreak of the revolution. He took refuge in Norwalk and was, and was uh, practicing his art of metal, of metal uh, silver work in Norwalk until the British uh, invaded in 1779 and burned Norwalk to the ground pretty much. And the Jewish families there uh, fled to Aaron Cardozo's house in Wilton on Route 7. And uh, they said that the, the room was like, it was a very small room. There were like 30, at least 30 people crowded into this little room, of which uh, uh, Meyer Myers was one of them. And uh, Meyer Myers uh, didn't stay all that long. Not, none of the families, I, I suppose, really did. But he fled north to Stratford. Uh, he rented a little house, uh, which coincidentally is now a part of the synagogue grounds of a Jewish uh, congregation there, coincidentally, and uh, practiced the art until the war was over. But uh, in any event, he ties in with the history of the Jews in Norwalk in that respect. Next, please. And uh, we'll move on because my memory at this stage of the game. Uh, at the moment. Now this is uh, Joseph Simpson, probably at the age of about 100, I think. Now Joseph Simpson lived to 101. Uh, he died in 1787, I think, and uh, was uh, was the uh, progenitor of a number of prominent families which unfortunately have died out. But he was a scholar rather than a good businessman, and. Uh, and fled with uh, with his son, one of his sons, uh, to Wilton during the revolution and remained uh, during the war there. And, uh, he was trying, trying to correspond with Jews in China, you know, he had all kinds of scholastic ambitions. Uh, next, please. Uh, this, my memory falls me again. I can't, uh, I can't remember at the moment. No, I'm sorry. Uh, he's Jacob Solis. Jacob Solis ties in with the Hayes family of Bedford Village. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware that there's a farmhouse facing the green in Bedford Village, which was built by David Hayes. The, and that David Hayes was a nephew of Abraham Hayes here in Greenwich. Um, by the way, that, that Abraham Hayes uh, had a um, had a sister named Charity Hayes, and I mention that only because uh, the David his, Abraham Hayes of Greenwich, his nephew, his grand nephew, I should say, no, his nephew David Hayes of Bedford, named also a daughter named Charity Hayes, and uh, there was still another one named Charity Hayes, but. What I want to point out is, uh, when my talk is over, uh, I post these two photos up here of, uh, of two of the Hayes family who grew up in that house facing the green in Bedford Village. Their father was David Hayes, a farmer all his life, uh, who was born in Rye in 1732, I believe. Uh, this is another Charity Hayes, a daughter of David Hayes. And uh, I give you a time frame that's why I'm giving you some dates. She was born in Bedford in 1782. And uh, this dour looking fellow here is her older brother. Uh, and he is Jacob Hayes, also named Jacob Hayes, who was born in that house, well not that house, because that was burned by the British during the war. Main Street, 
Main Street, and it's right adjoining the hotel that stood until 19, I guess about 1922. There's a big hotel that adjoining that on the left. What's that? Where on Main Street? Uh, that would be uh, um, a little. Fr it's well, it's across the street, not exactly from the end of Pacific Street. The Pacific meant Main. It was across the street where the New York Bakery used to be, and then a little further south. Um, as a matter of fact, that Tobias Bernhard owned a hotel which he bought in 1885 across the main street called the Stanford House Hotel. Uh, but uh, Wolf Cohen by, was getting older, so that by 1874 he moved out and, and uh, became strictly a merchant tailor and opened the store in Park Row with his daughter as a she had a military shop there at that time. Next please. Uh, now here we, this is out of sequence. I was talking about Daniel P. Hayes, Daniel P. Sugar Hayes. Uh, he was the mayor of Pleasantville. He's the fellow you saw in that photo a few minutes ago. And uh, it's on this firehouse in Pleasantville, the Daniel P. Hayes Hose Company. So at one time we had a, a fellow working here doing some work at our house. And he said he lived in Pleasantville. And I said, oh, really? I said, uh, he says, yeah. I said, um, he says, I'm a, I'm a member of the volunteer uh, fire company over there. Fire company. I said, really? I said, who's that Daniel P. Hayes name there? He says, I don't know, he's some Irish politician. <laughs> so I, I said to him, really? I said, well, let me tell you something. Let me give you a little history. So I, <laughs> next please. And now, here I was speaking about um, uh, 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 about uh, uh, Cohen, Wolf Cohen's first ad I could find in the Advocate, and it tells you about well, this, but this part didn't sh doesn't show it, but this is from 1856, the Advocate, and it says here uh, that he sells overcoats, pants, dress, shirts, drawers, Indian rubber suits, just received and will be sold at a very uh, <laughs> advance from cost. Please call and examine my goods and prices, as you may save money by calling here before purchasing elsewhere. W. Cohen, opposite Baskin's Grocery on Main Street. And uh, Wolf Cohen actually, he says in the 1870 census, he said he was born in, in uh, I don't know what was it. He said he was born in Warsaw, Germany, or something like that. Yeah, Warsaw, Germany. Uh, next, please. And this is Tobias Bernhard, Bernhard, one of the early uh, Jewish merchants in Stanford. He came there, he worked for his brother Robert in uh, Bridgeport, and in 1867 uh, came to Stanford, and by then he had saved quite a bit of money for that time. He had saved apparently about $700, which he was going to invest in opening a store in Stanford to sell millinery and, and fa what they called fancy goods. Uh, so he did on Main Street, and as he was walking past this empty store on Main Street, uh, there, there was a man sweeping the sidewalk, and it happened to be Mr. Seeley, and Mr. Seeley owned the building. So he said, how much you know, uh, do you want to rent the store? was satisfactory, and Sealy says, you, you have it. And Bernard became very successful, uh, but his sons didn't, uh, he invested a lot of real estate, and he did very well uh, for those days. He was very, very uh, a citizen of town. Next, please. Uh, this is the, I showed this, this is the Stanford House Hotel, which uh, Bernard bought in 1885. It's at the corner of Stage Alley in Main Street, those of you who remember. And uh, uh, down at that lower level, um, I can't remember the merchant's name. A Jewish merchant opened on the lower level. Oh, it was Saul Adams. Uh, Saul Adams uh, uh, came to Stanford about 1886. And he opens a, uh, a, men's, a men's store down at the lower level of that uh, hotel that Bernhard owned. And did very well so that in two years he moves up to Main Street and at a uh, very substantial building. I have some photos showing 
a big uh, bill, bill, billboard, you know, sign he had on the side of a building right, right near the old town hall. And he was so successful, but got tired of the business that in 1892 he sold out to two brothers, Israel and Frank Martin, which after World War I became Frank Martin, called his. And, uh, and so, uh, uh, the Saul Adams became the first a Jewish real estate broker in Stanford. Uh, he, opened, uh, he opened an office on uh, Little Summer Street, and, uh, and eventually about to acquire quite a bit of property around town, River, River Street, which is now Washington Boulevard, and uh, all around town. And I remember Barney Plotnick, uh, an attorney, telling me, he says, I remember as a, as a youngster, he says that's probably he wasn't living here any living in Stanford anymore, but he moved to New York. He had a home I, I understand about 1905 when he moved, or maybe a little bit earlier, on Central Park West by that time. And so uh, he said, but some of the you know Christian children run around and call the Sheeny Sheeny Acts. But uh, eventually he just uh, I guess the best of himself to go back and uh, remain to New York. Next, please. Uh, let's see if I can. I said, it was in here. Oh, this is, this is a, this is a wonderful, uh, it's actually, you can't, I don't expect that you be able to read that here, but it's a wonderful uh, account of the marriage of Tobias Bernhardt's brother, younger brother Henry. Uh, in, uh, this was in 1871, uh, they were married here in the bride's uh, parents' home in Broad Street, Stanford, and uh, her father had uh, Rabbi Henry Bittler, who was an a, a Orthodox rabbi of what was then and is Congregation B'nai Jeshurun in New York, and uh, come to Stanford and perform the wedding ceremonies, and the advocate printed, printed an entire account of the wedding with the, with the band in the house, you know, and all the refreshments and so forth and so on. Uh, uh, this was 1871, and one year later, Henry and his bride Rachel, she was a daughter of Wolf Cohen, that tailor merchant. Uh, and so uh, a year later, 1872, they moved to Middletown, Connecticut. And uh, which ties in just with a, uh, as a, as a side, side account, uh, we, I, I had a friend I knew from Temple Sinai, uh, um, Harry Bernard, and I was conducting a course, that's about 1975, and he comes up to me afterwards on Jewish history, he says, do you think that Bernard is there any relation to my family? I said, could be, but I have no idea. So later on, I was able to tie in that uh, his, it was his great-grandfather. Uh, and uh, his uncle, of course, his great-grandfather was Tobias. But uh, the, the Bernhards eventually uh, moved back to New York and uh, were making no money business. And Henry, and Henry Bernard had a very, he was president of the founder of the Board of Trade in Middletown and so forth and so on. But anyway, uh, this is a marvelous account that the, that the advocate printed at that time of a Jewish wedding at that time. Yes, yeah, right, sure. Next, please. And this is Rabbi Bedford. Uh, apparently, I got, I, I got a letter from, yeah, a letter, this is many years ago, probably uh, uh, 20, no, 10, 15 years ago, uh, from a descendant. Uh, the name is Dodge, the Dodge family. Uh, we're not Jewish. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, and apparently uh, this fellow was on to die, and he conserved an estate, and apparently his great-great-grandfather was this rabbi, uh, and the bit of, one of the bit of us had married into the Dodge family, and uh, there may have been some sort of dispute, in any event, he wanted as much information as I might have uh, concerning his, uh, his ancestor. Uh, he was a, uh, what they called in those days, a uh, uh, the Moscoline, the scholars, these are the scholars and when these rabbis or whatever would come to New York from the other side, from Europe, 
Uh, they would come to his house in Lower Manhattan on the East Side or whatever. It wasn't the East Side at the time. Uh, because he was the rabbi of the Nate Jeshurun, which in those days was on Green Street, which is now Soho. Uh, the, the East Side really didn't. Uh, uh, it, was, it was first starting to develop Jewish, uh, probably, uh, probably in the 1840s. It was the first beginning it was mostly German Jews at that point. Uh, next, please. Okay. Now here we are, this ties in with Stanford again. Uh, that Benjamin Nathan, he's descended from uh, Hazan Gershon Ben Bisatius, and he's descended from all these early the Jewish families. This is a print of him in Harper's Weekly, uh, 1870. The reason being, he was, a, he was a summer resident here at Stanford. He rented a house on Strawberry Hill uh, from, uh, a, from a professor whose name slips, slips me at the moment. And uh, very prominent, he was the secretary of the New York Stock Exchange at one time. He was the president of the Congregation Shear of Israel when it was in, uh, in uh, further downtown. And, uh, but, and, and had a beautiful home uh, on uh, West 23rd Street, between 5th and 6th Avenue, for those of you who are familiar with Manhattan. And this is the area where Peter Cooper lived around the corner, you know, and it was uh, very uh, upscale. In any event, uh, in 1870 it was. Uh, mysteriously, he had a son who gambled and drank a lot, but no one, no one knows. He was murdered mysteriously in his home on West 23rd Street. And uh, they put the son Washington Nathan on trial. It was a, it was a big uh, to-do. And it was in Harper's Bazaar and all that. And he was eventually acquitted and the son went to Paris to live, I think. And uh, in any event, uh, this is why this drawing of him and Harper's Weekly was done uh, around that time. And a year later, Justice Benjamin Nathan Cardozo uh, was named after him. That was his uncle. And so that's why he was named for him. Uh, I don't think we have that much more to go. Uh, do we have uh, anyone like to uh, continue? Otherwise, I'll stop it here. And I'm welcome to all questions that you may have. Any questions? No? Thank you. Yeah. No. In, in, in Stanford, for example, had a number of Jewish home factories uh, down on. Uh, um, that down to it, I was going to say the South End. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm talking about the 1870s, 1880s. For example, in Norwalk, you had a, a very, you may recall, a very large factory building, you know, I 95, not too many years ago. It's gone now. And it had a big uh, broad iron sign that said RNG. Well, RNG stood for the Wolf and Goldschmidt. And in the 1880s, they were one of the largest corset manufacturers in the United States. They were turning out 10,000 courses a day at that factory over there. So, but they, to my knowledge, maybe one of the partners lived. I don't even think he lived in Norwalk. Most of the factories that in those days there was a spender factory. You know this. The owners actually lived, for the most part, in New York. We have, have either a, uh, a relative to be the superintendent of the factory. And uh, we lived, we wouldn't come to live here. They live in, in the city. Well, thank you all very much. Question? We don't know. Uh, we, uh, for example, the Hayes family came about 1718. One of the members of the family had written an account. Uh, how accurate it is, nobody really knows. But um, uh, even on the family tree, it shows Michael Hayes and the son of like Abraham and Branch and so forth. But it shows no name for the mother. Now, whether the mother was already deceased when they came to America, we don't know. There's no name. Um, 
Oh, well, Hayes was unusual. Uh, the family said they came here with their own, in their own chef from Holland. Uh, they came with a few servants, had some cattle. That's cool. So they were fairly prosperous when they came. Uh, but most of the other early families um, came to very little. But uh, these were adventurous people. And ha they came uh, uh, usually from by way of Holland because Holland was very welcoming in those days. Uh, to, uh, unlike other European countries, but the Jews coming from all different uh, Andrus Trubies, for example, they actually came from uh, uh, Lithuania. Um, other state from Germany, Poland, Hungary, and they, the only place that they wanted to leave that had something they wanted to really be successful was to get to Holland and then go to London and then possibly make their way to wherever they want to go. Yes? When you were talking about Hart, Jacob, is it? Jacob Hart? Yeah, you mentioned, I think, that he couldn't serve on a grand jury. Yes. He couldn't do something else. Uh, couldn't and he couldn't vote. When did those kinds of things change? Well, I think I think it changed about 1818, when the religious test in Connecticut was um, was, was, it was you know just obliterated, it was just taken off the books at that time. But I believe that's that, that's when the first, uh, for example, in Delaware, Jews couldn't serve in public office until 1825. Uh, uh, a non-Jew, Thomas Kennedy, who was a legislator in Delaware. Uh, for many, many years, possibly 10, 15 years, was presenting bills to the Delaware legislature to, uh, to uh, take away this, this liability against Jews. And he kept on getting the figure, but he never gave up, Thomas Kennedy. He became a hero to the Jewish community in Delaware. And um, I'm sorry, I was in Delaware. Most of my head was Maryland. Maryland. And, uh, and so, uh, that's what it was like in certain places. Now, for example, uh, Solomon Franco, a Jew, was warned out of Washington in 1649. But in Charleston, South Carolina, Jews apparently were always welcome. Always welcome. And they formed their first congregation in 1749, organized, got the uh, the Jews of Savannah. Always welcome. From 1733, they came with, some of them came with all of them. So, uh, in many ways, up here you had a much tighter social structure up here in Connecticut. And, uh, for example, Jews couldn't, weren't accepted into the Masons in Stanford, in, into Union Lodge. And I, when I spoke to Bonnie Plotnick many years ago, uh, he, fought, they, he helped, well, I don't know if he helped form, but he helped, I think he helped form Roosevelt Lodge in Stanford in 1922 because Jews weren't accepted into, and yet, you go to Charleston, and in the old Jewish cemetery at Cumming Street of Bethel Elohim, there's a plaque inside the cemetery, a big plaque, put there not too long ago about the, the, um, uh, the, high, the founders of the uh, Mason of I lost my uh, the rank. But anyway, it was a very high rank. They were among the founders of the Scottish Rite, the Masons, in, in, uh, in Charleston. They were accepted. They were, uh, in many lodges, they were the founders. Up here in New England, the only, the only exception I had found was, was one of the Hayes family, Moses Michael Hayes, who was born in New York, uh, eventually becomes very successful in Newport, Rhode Island until the Revolution, and then moves to Boston. And in Boston, he eventually becomes the Grand Master of Masons up there. But uh, other than that, uh, it, it, depending on the locality, Jews are welcome in some places, and others, there was a limit. Yes? Um, I, I mentioned before. Yes, and I, 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 why don't we talk about that? As soon as I'm finished, I want to speak with you about that. Definitely. Okay. Sure. I'll be right there. Thank you. Thank you very much.